Good morning, church. How are we doing? I want to say good morning to Building A in Southwestern Dripping Springs as well. It's good to be in Building D. Uh, thank you for weathering the storms to be here. I think God's got something for us. So as it thunders, as it lightens, let's just focus in on what the Lord has. Let me pray for you as we open the text today. Father, I pray that as we come to the text, um, there's a lot going on for a lot of us today. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things happening even outside our buildings. And Father, I just pray the next 30 or so minutes you would change our lives. I pray you'd open our hearts because that's what your word does. I pray that you would make us more like you today. And that we'd leave better prepared to live this week because we've spent time at your feet. In your name we pray. Amen. In John chapter 5, we'll be finishing chapter 5 today. We are already 25% of the way through the Gospel of John. We are flying. And we're going to finish chapter 5 today. I'm going to start in verse 30. So one of the things that's bothered me throughout um, my decades now of ministry is pastors that have been close to God, it seems like, success in ministry, churches that grow, people that come to faith, and then you see them in their later years walk away from the faith. You see them make bad decisions. As a matter of fact, as you read your Bible, most of the folks make bad decisions later in life, not early in life. I think people get bored. I think people get resources, and resources and boredom together can cause some problems for people. I think people lose their passion. Um, I've watched many seminary professors who have been in the Word every day for most of their lives, know the Greek, know the Hebrew, and then over later years, they start to turn liberal. They start to um, conceptualize what the Scriptures say in the context of culture instead of what culture means in the context of Scripture. And it's troubled me. Um, one of the struggles I've had as I read my Bible is how can Jewish people for generations wake up before sunrise and read the Torah and have the promises and have the sacraments and have the festivals and have the Old Testament and have the understanding of the Messiah to come and then miss it. And as you look at the history of Jewish people throughout our earth, they've been very successful in commerce, very successful in finance, very successful in art, uh, very successful in everything they do. Matter of fact, our Western culture was founded on many of the values that came from Israel as a people. And yet, the nation of Israel takes the most defiant stance against who Jesus Christ is of any other nation in the history of the world. How can that be? How can you have the scriptures and the law and the promises and miss it? Well, better, better question for us this morning, how do we? How do we have a full canon? How do we see miracles every day? And how do we still doubt whether God loves us, whether God is able, whether God cares, whether God is sovereign, whether God is going to do what he's promised? So far in John, we've seen a few great stories. We've seen a few amazing miracles. But if you notice chapter 5, if your Bible has red print, it's all red. And really chapter 5, for the rest of the book, it goes downhill to the cross. Jesus, we saw last week in verses 19 through 30, made some claims that will ultimately get him killed. The claims were such like this, I am going to judge everyone. I and the Father are one. Uh, I and the Father uh, do everything together, meaning I can't do anything that's outside the will of the Father. As I said last week, Jesus is impeccable. He is incapable of sinning. Uh, as we saw last week, he is, he is the homoousius. He is the same substance, the same essence of the Father. He was claiming to be God in the flesh. And from that point forward, we see this downward spiral, not just in our Bible, but also in the minds of Israel as a, as a people group. Look with me at verse 30. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. Now, that should trigger something. If you look back at verse 19, where we started last week, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. So I think verse 19 and verse 30 are two bookends and what he said 19 through 30 last week, the claims he made, now he's going to tell us why the Jewish nation would reject him. He's going to answer the question of what I started my sermons with. How can someone have all this knowledge, all this insight, and miss it? Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He can judge Jesus is saying, because I'm just. When you're perfectly righteous, you get to make judgment calls on human beings. 
And Jesus is claiming that. He is claiming that he is not just perfect, not only equal to the Father, but he is incapable of being anything less than perfect. Um, back in, in the history of the church, uh, pastors, much like judges, would wear black robes when they preach. I actually have a black robe. I did one, my first wedding here in, in Austin was in the month of August, and they asked for the black robe, and I think I, I died that day. Um, <laughs> pastors would often wear these black robes, and I think the purpose is theological as much as anything else. The thought is that you see some ears to hear God, you see some eyes to see the people of God, you, you see a voice to speak the truths of God, but you don't see a, a human body. It's just a mouth and eyes and ears to communicate, and the human essence kind of melts away in that robe. You would often go to churches where you'd see choir members in robes, and the thought was, let's not distract with what we're wearing or anything about our personable uh, presentation. Let's just put the robes on. And, and Jesus is saying here that uh, not only when I speak am I speaking the words of God, but I am God. And that you don't need a human thought on that because I'm telling you who I am. I am just. Look at verse 31. He's going to prove it to you. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. In the Old Testament, it would take two to three witnesses to verify a fact, whether that be in court or between just a conflict. Jesus is saying, I can tell you I'm the Son of God, which I just did. You're not going to believe that, but I'll give you some witnesses. Matter of fact, he's going to go beyond the two to three witnesses of the Old Testament. He's going to give you four witnesses in the text today. Uh, I would like to think he's given five. So he's going to double what the Old Testament required as witnesses. And you can kind of write these down as we go through these witnesses. The first witness, verses 32 to 35, is the witness of John the Baptist. Look with me at verse 32. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. He's not talking about John the Apostle who's writing this book, although John the Apostle loves to remind you he's the one Jesus loved. He's talking about John the Baptist. That you guys liked John the Baptist for a while. You came, you enjoyed his preaching, you thought he was a novel act, if you will. You enjoyed it for a while. He was a lamp, he was the witness. I like to think of John the Baptist as the anchor leg coming from the Old Testament, the last racer that gets us uh, to the New Testament. And the truth is, humans need eyewitnesses. Deity doesn't. God doesn't need to have an eyewitness, but he gives eyewitnesses because human beings need eyewitnesses. And Jesus could also say the same thing, I'm telling you who I am, but that's not going to be enough for you. If you won't listen to a human, maybe you'll listen to other humans say the same thing about that human. And it's interesting because the Old Testament speaks of Israel as being under a curse, a veil, if you will, that they have the promises, they have the oracles, but because they chose to disobey God at different times, they no longer could hear the voice of God. Matter of fact, when your Old Testament ends chronologically in Nehemiah and begins in, 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 in the Gospels, about 400 years past where God doesn't send a prophet. It, we call it the dark years, the silent years, where God just stops talking because no one's listening. And it's interesting as he talks about John the Baptist being the witness here because he says John the Baptist was a lamp. He was a light. He wasn't the light. John says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the light. But I'm a light that's lighting the way for the light to come. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Matter of fact, Peter says, the prophecy we hold as a lamp, he says, in dark places. So even though Israel was under a veil because they had disobeyed, there was always in your Old Testament that if you read it sincerely and you prayed that God would be near to you and open the scriptures to you, you would see the understanding of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament, another way of saying that is this. Continued disobedience cuts off the voice of God in our lives. That eventually, and this should be sobering for you because you listen to sermons on every Sunday. I listen to sermons every day of the week because I preach it to myself. But every time I preach a sermon to you, there is something you must do to respond. People will say, well, like I said last week, why don't you give a response to sermons? You have to respond to every sermon. Because what will happen is if we do not forgive others when we hear that we are to forgive, when we're not kind, we hear we're to be kind, we're not generous, we hear that we are to be generous, ultimately, biblically speaking, we'll stop hearing the voice of God. 
that the scriptures will stop meaning things to us. It'll stop leaping off the page to us. Our souls will be something uh, less than crisp. Look with me at verse 36. He says, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness, there it is again, about me that the Father has sent me. Second witness. Jesus says, if you won't listen to a human, maybe you'll believe what your eyes see. You've seen me turn water into wine. You've seen a massive revival among the Samaritans. You've seen me hear a no, uh, heal a nobleman's son. If you won't believe what I'm saying, believe what I'm doing. The purpose of miracles in the life of Jesus was not to draw big crowds. The purpose of the miracles in the life of Jesus was to draw a crowd unto Jesus himself as the Messiah. Meaning that it was to cause men and women who needed more than a human to say things to actually believe what they were seeing. Matter of fact, the people who killed Christ also saw Lazarus alive after he was dead. And one of the things that I'm gonna keep hitting all through the morning is this. And if you guys remember, I did the series Cast of Characters, and I did Judas. The main point for Judas was this. Judas saw all the same miracles that the other apostles saw. Judas did all the same things, preached all the same things. Proximity with Jesus does not equal intimacy with Jesus. Proximity with Jesus does not equal intimacy with Jesus. Meaning this, the danger for you and I is we can hear hundreds of sermons, maybe thousands. We can take notes, we can nod our head, we can even say amen, whether it's out loud or inside our own hearts. But if we're not doing what the Bible says, then the Bible has no influence over our lives other than when you open up a fortune cookie or shake an eight ball, if you remember those. It has the same power, looking at the horoscope in the paper. It has no, it's a rabbit foot. Because Jesus raised three dead people from death to life, including himself. Jesus healed people from disease, from demon possession, and people still didn't believe him. Look at verse 37. And the Father, here's the third witness, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Third witness, if you're not going to believe human witness, John the Baptist, if you're not going to believe the miracles you see, what I've done, then when John the Baptist baptized me, there was an audible voice, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You have heard the voice of God. But he says, you haven't heard the voice of God. Why have they not heard the voice of God? Because they have not obeyed the will of God. And so their ears don't work anymore. That's why Jesus says over and over, for he who has ears, let him hear. Everyone has ears. Some actually listen and hear spiritually, which is what Jesus taught. He says, you've never heard God. You've never seen God. His word is not in you. If his word is not in you, you're not going to believe in me whom he sent. Meaning this, when the word of God does not abide in us, that word abide is all through the book of John. John 15, the great passage. Unless the, the word of God abides in you and he and you, and you and him, you can do nothing in your own power. That word abide, remain. I, I carry the idea when I teach it of renting a house versus owning a house. When you rent a house and you don't like the wallpaper, you can't just rip it off. You have to get permission. You can't just pull the carpet out, you don't own the house. But when you own a house and your wife says, I don't like that wall anymore, it's not a load-bearing wall, I, I already found out for you, you gotta knock that wall down. You gotta rip that carpet up. You gotta repaint those walls. You own it. When you become a Christian, he doesn't rent you. If he wants to rip the carpet out, he can rip the carpet out. He owns you. And so he's saying here that when the word of God has no effect in your life, you're not gonna think properly about who Jesus is. You're not going to obey Jesus. You'll obey Jesus as long as it makes sense for you, as long as it benefits you, as long as it makes you feel good. But once it, get into, it gets into being broken and humble and yielding and submitting and putting someone else's rights above your own, you're not going to want to do it then. Everyone loves Jesus until it costs something. That's why often you'll see it through the book of John. He'll say something tough and the crowds thin out and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Jesus says, not only is my miracles themselves the witness, but my father is the witness as well. Here's why I said four or maybe five. I put a, I put a fourth one here, 
Then the Holy Spirit, the dove, came and descended upon Jesus at the baptism. I think that is two-thirds of the Trinity saying at that moment, this is the one you guys have been waiting on. Don't miss it. So the Holy Spirit's been a witness. The Father's voice has been a witness. When he says form, I believe one of the things he's talking about is the form of the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus. At that moment, his miracles have been the witness. John the Baptist was a witness. And they're still not listening. They're still not getting it. The problem is, you don't have the word abiding in you. Do you think this can happen in church today? Do you think people can go to church week after week after week after week and there's no, I'll use a cultural phrase here, there's no warmth in their heart toward the things of God. There's no conviction of sin. There's no desiring the glory of God in their lives. Absolutely. I believe that's how seminaries get twisted. I believe that's how whole denominations change over time. Some of you grew up in a denominational church and you remember it being very solid biblically and now it's not and you're going, what happened? What happened is people stopped obeying the word of God. The word of God did not abide in them. They did not abide in it. The word of God lost the authority of the voice of God. And so now men and women are left to their own concoctions of what they think about God and how cultural views God, how culture views God and they bring up their own con, uh, contraption, and they call it scripture. So then you pick and choose the verses you like. Wouldn't that be a great Bible? Just kind of cut and paste everything. This Bible would be so thin if it was left up to us. It would have one or two things. Do what I say and I'll bless you, and we take out the do what I say part. <laughs> Just we'd leave the blessed part in there. We would take out the whole Sermon on the Mount. We'd probably take out most of the Gospels. We'd definitely take out Paul. We don't want anything to do with that crazy guy. Paul says the law for Israel was a tutor that brought them to Christ. Remember, I've been teaching this over the last several months that the law doesn't save you. It just brings you to the cross. It convicts you of sin. It shows you you have a need. It doesn't give you a solution. In the Old Testament, you have a bunch of rules because you, the law is a tutor. You and I are little babies. You have to be told this is how you marry. This is how you spend your money. This is how you raise your kids. This is how you approach God. In the New Testament, you don't see those rules because you're under the age of grace. Now you're supposed to be spiritually mature. Mature people don't need rules. You don't need a curfew when you're spiritually mature. You just need to be trusted because you've been trustworthy. And that's the purpose of your New Testament. Paul says the Old Testament was a law. How did you know the word did not abide in their hearts, Jesus? Because they did not believe in me as being from the Father. How do you know who misses it in the Gospels? It's how they view Jesus. If they view Jesus as the Messiah, they get it. If they miss it, they missed it. How do denominations and seminaries and people fall? What do they think about Jesus? I can go places, I've said this before, I can go places to speak, talk about mysticism, talk about religion, talk about sacrifices, talk about doing certain things, rituals, rites, and people applaud. If I go and start talking about surrendering and yielding under the lordship of the master named Jesus, the things come out. We like religion. We don't want to be told what to do. Religion is man's contraption to fix a system so that they don't have to be told what to do anymore. Isn't it funny that when we create religion, we create more rules? We actually like rules. We just want to create the rules, which is what religion is. You follow me? You awake? Because it's raining outside. I know some of you are like, oh, this is tough. All right, let's go to verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. There's your last witness, the scriptures. So you've got John the Baptist, you've got the miracles of Jesus, you got God the Father, you got the Holy Spirit, and the fifth witness is the scriptures themselves. They testify about me, Jesus says. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Why? This is getting down to the question I started the sermon with. Why do people walk away having tasted the goodness of God or why do they reject coming to him whatsoever regardless of what God does in their life? I would say it's because of, this is gonna sound real theological deep. I'm gonna try to make it real simple. We don't want to. 
That's why we don't come. We don't, look, look what he says in verse 40. This is the thing. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It literally says, you will not come to me for life. You think you'll get life outside of me. So you won't come to me because you don't like where I take you in life. You don't like the way I rule your life. So you will not come to me because you don't want to. Why do people walk away from God later in life? Because they want to. Because they think there's a path that's better. You remember the rich young ruler? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus says, what does the law teach? Well, it, the law teaches you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, okay, I'll play the game. Do that. <laughs> and the rich young ruler wants to play this philosophical game like most people do when you start talking about Jesus. Well, who is my neighbor? Seeking to justify himself, the scripture says, who is my neighbor? You know this nebulous love God thing? You can't really measure that, so I'm good with that part. But when you say love your neighbor, who is that? Because I got a bunch of people I don't want in that category. When I say love your neighbor, you, you and I both start thinking about people that that's going to be tough to do, that we don't like in that category. Maybe it's even the other political party. Amen, church? Well, I'll love anybody as long as they're like me. I'll love anybody as long as they love Jesus. I'll love... Isn't it even more important to love people who don't love Jesus? <laughs> Isn't it even more people, more reason to love Jesus who are in darkness and hopeless without Christ? And so the rich young ruler plays the game. You, you and I play the same game. We have a spiritual resume. Do you think you'll go to heaven if you die? Well, sure I do, because compared to Stalin, Hitler, and Manson, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. And we think there's a standard. We set the standard, and we don't really know what the standard is. We just know we're a little above the standard. And we do the same thing. We think we're pretty good people. What should the lawyer have said to Jesus? He would have been right up there with Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house today. Get down to the tree. I believe. I'm going to go sell everything I got and I'm going to give it back four times. What I've, what I've cheated people. He would have been the other Nicodemus or the other Zacchaeus and the other Nicodemus in the New Testament. If he would have said something like, I can't do that. I've tried to love people. And here's the problem. I'm a big, fat sinner. I confess to you, I can't do that. That, is, that. that has to be from divine enablement. I need help. Mercy. That man's life would have changed that day. Much like the rich young ruler was the nation of Israel. We have loved God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength because we have come up with ways to measure that. And based on our score pads, we're good. Well, who's not good? Everybody else. <laughs> who gets to determine who's good and who's not? The good ones. Does that sound like church some of you grew up in? Here are the rules. We decide, and we'll let you know if you're doing okay or not. We'll whack you if you step out of line. That's why a lot of people grow up thinking in the United States of America that God is this police officer with a big stick on a rocking chair whacking people when they get out of line. But instead, in wishing to justify himself, who is my neighbor? This guy just says, hey, I don't want to love people. I really don't want to do what you're telling me to do. So why do people walk away from God once they've tasted his goodness or never come to him to start with? Because of ignorance and error. Simply put, they don't want to. It's the same reason why you and I won't forgive someone, even though you hear me preach about forgiveness all the time. We don't want to. We feel in control when we hold a grudge, and I like control. It's the same reason why half our membership won't tithe at all at Austin Ridge, even though I preach about it all the time, and Jesus talks about it a whole lot more than I do, because we don't want to because we like money. It's the same reason why people will continue to date non-Christians, thinking they can change them, even live together because everyone else does, because we don't like to do it God's way. We think the world's way, we think the world has figured out how to have great relationships in marriage. Now think about that, how silly it is. We really just don't want to. In the Gospels, there's two types of people that follow Jesus. There's the wise, broken Jewish people who believe who he says he is, 
And then there's the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the demon possessed that are healed who are so desperate they realize we'll never keep the law the way those religious guys say we have to. We've already failed. We need help. And those are, those are two categories that I see Christians are in. It's those of us who grew up in church, grew up loving Jesus, and we haven't had to do all the dumb things, and you think your testimony's boring, there's nothing greater than a boring testimony. If you get up and say, you know what, honestly, grew up in church, my mom loved Jesus, my dad loved Jesus, I love Jesus, I saw great marriage growing up, I went to college, I thought rebelling was stupid, I saw my friends destroy their lives, I just, I don't know, I didn't do it. I think it's dumb. I want to remember the weekend, not forget about it and tell you how great it was, but I can't remember it. It doesn't make sense to me. Those are amazing testimonies. Versus someone has to get up and say, well, let me tell you for the next 20 minutes how I blew up life. And then finally, because God broke me to a point, I had nothing else to do but depend on him where he changed my heart. And they'll give God glory a little bit at the end. But it's really about all this stuff. Praise the Lord that we can raise children in Austin's Bible Church that love Jesus at a young age and don't have to do all the dumb stuff. That they can be sitting here at 30 going, I'm not perfect, but I love Jesus deeply and I always have. What an amazing testimony, amen? So you see the testimony of what Jesus is putting together. The reason you don't want to come to me is because you don't want to come to me. Here's what also he's saying, and I want you to get this. Go back with me to verse 40. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Look at 41. I do not receive glory from people. Who's he talking to in this passage? Religious people. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Let me help you connect the dots a little bit here. The religious people love to be religious in front of people. The religious people wore robes and tassels, and the more godly deeds you did, the longer your tassels were. They loved to have long tassels. They loved to pray in public, and they would have these long, gargantuan prayers. You ever heard church prayers I'm talking about? That guy you work with gets up and prays. I'll never forget Northwest Bible Church in Dallas. A guy got up and prayed, and I'm sitting by someone as he's praying, and he's just glossing the Milky Way with his prayer, and the person beside me is going, oh, good grief. I said, you know this guy? He goes, I work with him. <laughs> and these guys would pray and they'd go into the tabernacle and they would take all their tithe and they would put it in a coin so they could dip it in the, and hear it spin down. And hey, I came in, listen, all this money I'm putting in. They loved it. It's interesting what Jesus says. Look at it with me again, verse 41. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Point. When you care more about the approval of man, it is impossible to love God. We've got almost 90 staff people lost their raise. I sent an email out this week. How does the fear of man destroy your life? And I got back almost 90 emails. That when I fear what other people think, I walk in fear. When I'm concerned about how other people view me, I'm, I'm not myself. When I worry about what other people say, I don't confess sin. The Bible says confess your sins one to another. You're not gonna do that if you're worried about what everybody thinks about you because you've gotta keep this veneer that you've got everything together so you can't confess sin because that would disrupt the game that you play. I, I become anxious when I worry about what everybody thinks, I walk in the room and anxiety fills me. How do I look? What do people think? What are they looking at? What are they not looking at? And this fear, this constant need, this crave for the approval of human beings keeps us from confessing sin, keeps us from getting baptized publicly. There are people that say, I'm not gonna get baptized, that would be embarrassing. Jesus died on a cross, get wet. Who cares how you look in a wet t-shirt? You can tweet that out. Who cares what people think? Or people won't get in a small group because they don't want to open up because if they open up, then people won't think they're amazing. So they don't get in a small group. It keeps us out of community. It keeps us out of confession. It keeps us out of genuine service because if we do serve, we're really doing it so someone sees it, someone passes on the back, someone says thank you. I've had people say to me, I stopped serving the church because no one said thank you. 
We don't do this for the approval of man. We do this for the approval of God. We do this to bring glory and honor to God. If you serve and no one sees it, God sees it. God knows. I got a gift card this past week in my box anonymously. What a beautiful thing. I don't know who to thank. And it bothers me because I worry about what people think. Someone out there is not getting a thank you note. And that started bothering me. And I started thinking about my sermon. I got convicted. Why are you worried about someone not getting a thank you note? Just be grateful. I love that we have so many people lost in Ridge. They're like, you know what? I do all this stuff and no one knows and no one needs to know because God knows and I do it for his glory and not for my glory. Look at verse 41 again. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Jesus is saying, when Jesus, when I am not your complete satisfaction and your fulfillment, you'll never love me the way that you need to love me. The, the big word in our culture is fulfillment. People get jobs, young people get jobs, say, I just want to be fulfilled, I want to be fulfilled. When did the work become fulfillment? Like, I got news for you on this fallen orb called earth, you'll never be completely filled anything outside of Jesus. That job that fulfills you now won't fulfill you in a few years. That job that gives you joy now won't give you joy in a few years. You'll get the wrong decimate across from the cubicle. You'll get the wrong boss. You'll get the wrong account, and you won't like it anymore because guess what? Because it's meant to ultimately dissatisfy you. Jesus ultimately satisfies. Does this make sense? So I wonder if we have any people pleasers at Austin Ridge today. I'm a redeemed people pleaser. You know, being a people pleaser and a pastor doesn't mix. Because I got to say hard stuff to you guys. I got to kind of whip you and then help you get back up. <laughs> As we always say, the, the, the purpose of preaching is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I've had people come to me and say, oh man, I, I love your sermons, but man, I just, I feel like I'm all beat up all the time. Good! Because everything you're reading and everything you're listening to and everything you're listening to from your friends and family and culture is telling you how great you are. And I need Jesus. I need a Savior. I need redemption. I need forgiveness. I need brokenness. I need humility. I'm naturally pride, prideful. I need humility. Look at verse 43. I have come to my father's house, or my father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Jesus is saying that you religious people, I heard one pastor say, you're like religious cockroaches. <laughs> I hate cockroaches. You turn the lights on, what do they do? <laughs> they run. These religious leaders were religious cockroaches. Jesus starts talking about sin and the cross. <laughs> That's how it is when I preach sometimes. Certain people, you start talking about the cross and sin and brokenness. <laughs> But some cockroaches can fly. I, I, I moved here from Charleston. Those, those suckers fly. I remember my wife and I were in Charleston. This cockroach took off across the I'm like, what was that? Like a bat? I'd rather be spiritual moths who come to the light, right? You fly to the light instead of these cockroaches, these religious people. Look at verse 44. That was the best illustration I'd come up with that verse. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? That, that verse 44 is never quoted, never memorized, and it is powerful. How can you give glory to God when you are trying to receive people from other, uh, glory from other people? How can you please God when you're worried about what everybody else thinks? Now, the tendency is when I say don't worry about what people think, you go the other way and you become more, I don't care what anybody thinks. Sometimes we need to be concerned, people's feelings, people's emotions, how we speak, but we don't change our foundation of who we are and what we believe in to appease everyone else around us. Culture changes, it used to be every 30 years was a generation, then it said 10 to 15, I think it's every three to five. Generations change, views on things change. Look at verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you, the Father. Jesus said, I'm not going to accuse you. There's one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hopes. Hey, you think you're going to get to heaven because you've kept the law, the words of Moses, because you think you've met the standard that Moses talked about in over 700 laws of the Old Testament? You think you've done that perfectly? You're the rich young ruler of all these I've kept. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Great, Moses will condemn you. The law itself will condemn you. 
Look at verse 46. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So here's the indictment. I want to lay this out for you. A relentless string of indictments. Verse 38. You don't have God's word in you. You don't believe the one whom he has sent. Verse 40, you don't want to come to me. Verse 42, you don't have the love of God in you. Verse 43, you don't believe me. Verse 44, you cannot believe. Verse 45, you don't believe Moses and you don't believe me. And I don't think this is a uniquely Jewish problem. I don't think it has anything to do with ethnicity or religion. I think this is a human problem. That we really don't want to be mastered by anything or anyone. So what is Jesus' answer to caring more about the glory of God than what everyone else around us thinks. What's the answer of God? You tend to do what you believe in. And if you tend to believe that what people think matters more than what God knows, you'll tend to fear people more than God. A great thing that I like to do sometimes when I'm in a conversation or I hear something and I'm starting to get my, my feathers ruffled, I'm starting to get my feelings a little hurt, I stop back and I go, okay, Brad, are you getting mad because your feathers are ruffled or are you getting mad because the glory of God's being ruffled? Because there's a difference, because there's a place for righteous indignation. He starts turning tables over. There's a time to be angry. But is it because I'm getting pushed down, I'm getting denounced, I'm getting walked on, I'm getting talked about? Or is it, because the glory of God is being belittled in this conversation. In order, what Jesus is saying, in order to obey me and to abide in my word, you've got to kill the desire to be applauded by humans. And Jesus is saying death or life will come based on what you do with the glory. Either it's your glory or it's gonna be his glory. The basis of the gospel is not self-help. The basis of the gospel is gracious help, merciful help. If you're aware of your sin, then you will find Jesus appealing. If you're not aware of your sin, you think you're a pretty good person, you will find him quite offensive, the cross being quite offensive, the talk of sin being quite offensive. So heaven to you will sound good, but surrender and brokenness and humility will not sound good. It is possible to know your, bio, your Bible backwards and forwards and to miss trusting and following in Jesus. I hear it every four year in our church. I grew up in church, never got it. The light never came on. That you can be very religious. You and I can be just like Judas. Great proximity, but no intimacy. Intimacy. I think the greatest concern I have for the American church is those folks who proclaim to be believers who have been in church their entire lives, but their heart is cold and dead toward the things of God. When you hear the word of God preach, like today, you have to respond in some way. Today, the response may be, Lord, I need to denounce my desire to be approved by other people, that I confess to you I care more about what people think than what you know to be true. And as long as I look good on the public outside, I'm not as concerned about what you know behind closed doors, and that is wrong. And I confess that to you today. Help me to be more concerned about what you think and what you say than what other people around me think and say. To search the scriptures and to miss Jesus is the biggest tragedy of all, and millions will do it. So do we love Bible study? I know a lot of people who love Bible study. Or do we love Jesus? And so we study our Bibles. Bible study should not give you a fat head. It should give you a burning heart. If Bible study doesn't cause your heart to be stirred for lost people around you, it's probably not good Bible study. If it makes you feel like I'm just smarter than everyone else, it's probably not good Bible study. You ever been around pe preachers who are always throwing out long words with ology on the end of them, and, and the Greek it says this, and the Greek it says this, and the Greek it says this? I do that every once in a while if it helps the meaning. 
But I don't do that on purpose. It's not because I don't know big words. I paid a lot of money to go to Dallas Seminary to know big words. I want you to have a desire for Jesus, not just to know big words about Jesus. And if you have a desire for Jesus, then learn big words. It's fun. I love books. I don't order them online. That's wimpy. I like hardcover books. I like highlighters and marking it up. I'm old school. But none of that matters if my heart doesn't leap for Jesus. And I don't have personal worship time. And I don't love my family. And I'm not being pure in my thoughts, which is real easy to hide. And I'm worried about what, more what y'all think than what God knows to be true. You know, I've never understood why when a pastor gets fired from a church, not trying to bring up ideas, when a pastor gets fired from a church, that they get hurt and mad for years. If the elder board fires me tomorrow, Austin Ridge Bible Church owes me nothing. All I can say is thank you for providing for my family for 15 years and allowing me to serve you and do ministry alongside of you. Hurt and pain and anger comes in because we take things personally because we care more about what people think than what God knows to be true. Either we believe in the sovereignty of God and we bounce back or we don't and we stay wounded and hurt and angry. So who are you going to roll the dice on? That's what Jesus is saying in chapter 5. You're going to roll the dice on man or you're going to roll the dice on me? If Jesus rolled dice. <laughs> I'm going to roll the dice on the guy who died and then revealed himself to 500 more people. The guy who walked on water and pulled up Peter. I'm, I want that guy. The guy who Andrew bought a lunchbox to and says, we're going to feed all these people. Go ahead. That's the guy. I care about what he thinks. That is why I don't tell you enough, and I want to tell you this morning, I love you guys so much. I love you guys enough to teach the whole word of God to you. I love you guys enough to say the things you don't want to hear so that you can become the person you don't think you can become through the power of God, which will overwhelm your hearts. That's why I preach the way I preach. And sometimes I have people come and say, well, I'm thinking about bringing a friend, but what are you going to say Sunday? <laughs> You're not trusting the sovereignty of God. Because I've said some hard things and it hit you and it made it hit you right. Well, yeah, but they're not believers. You think God can't control how a non-believer hears something? We belittle the sovereignty and power of God, amen? Because we worry more about what people think. Well, I've gone over time and we're all convicted. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the memory of Judas someone who looked like everybody else, acted like everybody else. As a matter of fact, when John or Jesus said, someone's gonna betray me, John and Peter had no clue who it was. They had to ask, who is it, God? Is it me? Who is it? They had no clue because they fit right in. Lord, may we not have any Judases at Austin Ridge Bible Church. May I not be a Judas. May we be men and women who live in our 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s with such integrity and such passion, a heart that breaks for people because we care so much, because your word abides in us and we have grown a lifestyle of being secure and confident in who you say we are and not what the world thinks about who we are. And give us the courage to trust and care about your words and what you think more. It's in your name we pray. Amen.